the new American Diabetes Association 2024 Standards of Care are a really interesting updated document. There aren't any huge headlines, but there are a lot of subtle changes. And I think it's important that people really understand what the guidelines say and how we can apply it to patients. Now, the guidelines are long. They're 328 pages, and I've read every word. And I've summarized into two videos what I really think is important to know. And this first video is going to be more of the basic overview. And the second video will discuss treatment of people with type 2 diabetes. I am most interested in section 2, entitled Diagnosis and Classification of Diabetes. And the reason this section resonates so much for me is because it really characterizes what I do as a diabetologist. Because recommendation 2.5 says, classify people with hyperglycemia into appropriate diagnostic categories to aid in personalized management. It then goes on to say, quote, diabetes is conveniently classified into several clinical categories. Although these are being reconsidered based on genetic, metabolomic, and other characteristics and pathophysiology. And the reason this resonates with me so much is because as I've used CGM more extensively as my, in my patients, as we've had newer treatments for our patients with diabetes, I've learned that there must be many, many different types of diabetes because people vary a lot in terms of how they respond, what their glucose profiles look like. And I find that this really validates the fact that I often can't really tell what type of diabetes a person has, but I do know they have diabetes. And what I do clinically is try to figure out the best way to treat them. So even the title of section two has been changed. It used to be called classification and diagnosis of diabetes, but now it's called diagnosis and classification of diabetes. So basically what that means is first, let's figure out that this patient does or does not have diabetes, and then we'll try to classify it, but it might not fit into those simple categories that we all were trained that diabetes fits into. So it may not be just like classic type one or classic type two or classic other or GDM, what is this? And we really need to think that way. Now, they also focus on improving the standardization of approaches to diagnostic testing for diabetes. And they discuss hemoglobin A1C levels is really the sort of go-to tool that most of us use for diagnosing diabetes. And then they also reinforce the need for a second test to confirm the diagnosis. But the standards now talk about what we see not uncommonly, particularly using CGM, is that there may be a discordance between the glucose values that we see for CGM or finger stick and the A1C test results. And they discuss that the potential need for use of other biomarkers, such as fructosamine and glycated albumin, as an alternate method for measuring states of chronic hyperglycemia. They also discuss pancreatic diabetes or diabetes in the context of disease of the exocrine pancreas. And they talk about the importance of screening for diabetes in people following an episode of acute pancreatitis. So those individuals should be screened three to six months after they've had an episode of acute pancreatitis and then annually in individuals who have chronic pancreatitis to make sure they're not developing hyperglycemia. One of the biggest changes in the guidelines is regarding the use of teblizumab to help people with stage two type one diabetes slow progression to stage three type one diabetes. Now, for those of you who want to learn more about this, I would strongly encourage you to read the guidelines because they go into great detail about screening, who should be screened, what antibodies mean, and following patients over time. But to su suffice it to say is that not all prediabetes is actually pre-type 2 diabetes, 
And in individuals, particularly who have first degree family members with type one diabetes, screening for islet autoantibodies can be very important in terms of understanding what type of prediabetes they might have. Now, when you're following these patients over time, so you've diagnosed somebody with positive islet autoantibodies, and you want to see if they're developing actually overt type 1 diabetes stage 3, you can follow them with an A1C level, with an oral glucose tolerance test, and less specifically, you can follow them with continuous glucose monitoring. And I have a number of patients that I follow over time to watch to see if they are, in fact, progressing to stage 3 type 1 diabetes. But I think it's important to learn about this concept because we've never had anything before that can help slow progression to overt stage 3 type 1 diabetes. Turning to bone health. Section four includes recommendations for the regular evaluation and treatment of bone health, as well as general and diabetes specific risk factors for fracture. And they did this section in conjunction with the American Society for Bone and Mineral Research. And table 4.5, I think is really useful because they really try to provide specific guidance in terms of monitoring bone mineral density, assessing and preventing fracture risk, and really helping clinicians make treatment decisions. The diabetes-specific risk factors are a lumbar spine or hip T-score of less than or equal to minus two, frequent hypoglycemic events, diabetes duration of greater than 10 years, use of insulin, thiazolidine diones, and sulfonylurea agents, an A1C of greater than 8%, peripheral and autonomic neuropathy, and retinopathy and nephropathy. So I think this really adds to who we think of when we think about bone health in our patients with diabetes. The 2024 ADA standards of care continue to emphasize the very important focus on psychosocial health. Now, the standards discuss the concern over an increased rate of suicidality amongst patients with diabetes. But in terms of risk screening, it's important to really do what is considered appropriate for the patient and follow accordingly. In terms of other kinds of screening, the ADA now specifies that diabetes distress screening should be done at least annually. And in some cases, we do this more often in patients who have higher levels of distress to see if we're making a difference. For depression, the ADA also recommends at least annual screening and more frequent screening in patients who've had a history of depression. I really want to highlight the toolkit that's available to use in helping us take care of our patients who have behavioral health concerns. There's a 12 page guide for healthcare providers on how to support adults with type 1 or type 2 diabetes who have a whole host of psychosocial health issues from anxiety to depression to barriers to using insulin. They also include multiple questionnaires for us to use when we're trying to assess patients to look at whether or not they have distress or fear of hypoglycemia. And the questionnaires are all in one place because I'm always looking for questionnaires and it's really great that it's there. And then they have a document of handouts for healthcare providers to share with patients that cover topics related to these psychosocial health issues. So not only do they give us recommendations, they give us this toolkit, which I think is very important. In terms of the management of patients with type 1 diabetes in pregnancy, the use of CGM is further reinforced in addition to ongoing blood glucose monitoring. However, they do state that there is still not enough data to recommend the use of CGM in gestational diabetes or in pregnancy in people with type 2 diabetes. Now, I personally use CGM in people in both of these categories, but officially there isn't yet enough data to support this. They also state that use of CGM should be individualized based on treatment regimen circumstances 
preference, and needs. In terms of technology, they basically have an open-ended sentence. They say diabetes devices should be offered to people with diabetes. And there's a greater emphasis on education. And I couldn't stress that enough. I think if you couple a device with education, you can really help people make real changes in terms of their diabetes management. They also talk about automated insulin delivery systems and advocate for AID initiation in all adults with type 1 diabetes and even discuss its use at diagnosis. And again, they really go into the use of any of these tools along with education, but they also talk, as always, about individualizing the use of technology and discussing with patients what works best for them. They also have this part in the technology section, which I find really interesting and useful to think about, is that they think that healthcare providers should consider establishing technology-based competencies, meaning that healthcare providers should actually have a level of training and skill at using these technologies so that they can further help patients. And they recommend the use of online tutorials and training videos as well as written material to help providers understand the use of these devices. So that ends part one of the update on the 2024 standards of care. And although most of the changes may seem small, it, they really do represent changes in how we think about our patients and how we think about delivering care devices and all sorts of services to our patients who need them. So stay tuned for part number two, which will discuss management of type 2 diabetes and diabetes complications. Thank you.